So today I want to talk to you about industrial control systems. I put the word SCADA up there because when you usually talk to a large audience and you say ICS, a lot of people have no idea what that means. You say SCADA, they're like, oh yeah, power grids. I'm like, okay, good. Uh, industrial control system devices. So uh, I'll do a quick uh, sort of moment here on the fact that John's not here today. I may have to use some other clicker here. Uh, so John was supposed to be with me today, uh, but he is stuck in the hotel right now with food poisoning, so that kind of sucks. Um, but he was just so excited for a security ending conference, he just couldn't keep it in. So uh, for me, uh, I run a company. Oh, starting off slow, yeah. Uh, run a company called Dragos, but as mentioned, I do uh, teach over at SAN, so I wrote the Threat Intelligence course over there, Forensics 578, and I also uh, wrote the ICS 515 course, which is how to do hunting, how to do instant response work and network security monitoring in ICS networks. Uh, my background, I worked in the United States Air Force. I started off in the intelligence community side of the house, uh, built a mission looking at nation states breaking into critical infrastructure sites, and then try to take that knowledge out to the private sector to sort of teach and educate folks how to find that stuff. More importantly, though, I write a comic strip. I, uh, I found that it was really useful in the government audiences to be able to explain things to congressmen in three pain comics. So uh, I like taking, I like taking very technical concepts and putting them into comics. So I always have, you know, little Bobby, if you will, but little Bobby over here, like, yeah, virtual skate in the cloud, which is not what you should ever do. Um, so, oh, now it's gonna work. Is it? There we go, perfect. So, uh, what are we gonna talk about today? Three high level points that I will revisit throughout the uh, talk. Number one, these ICS environments aren't really common amongst each other. And what I mean by that is one substation for a portion of the power grid in this part of Georgia is gonna be configured, integrated, and look differently than a different substation in a different part of Georgia, let alone uh, the electric industry that does nuclear and coal-fired facilities versus a water distribution plant versus oil and gas. We like clumping things together as the ICS community, there is no ICS community. The only reason we say, and we in the ICS community, use the word ICS is to denote not IT. That's all ICS actually means, not <laughs> IT. Uh, some folks say, well, the oil and gas community. No such thing. There's oil, there's gas, there's upstream, there's downstream, there's midstream. There's different companies, there's different organizations. Um, so we'll talk about the lack of commonalities and then some of the few commonalities we can hold on to in terms of deploying out things like security under, uh, security onion to do monitoring. The second point up there is that network security monitoring is vital to ICS. There's lots of cool security things you can do in normal networks. Most of them are not applicable in an ICS. We're not gonna go through, we're not going to generally do a lot of whitelisting on controllers. We might get to the supervisory level where the actual SCADA stuff might be and do some whitelisting, <coughs> that's cool. But on PLCs, RTUs, IEDs, these weird, really weird little devices, not a lot of that's gonna apply. But network security monitoring does apply, and it applies very well. If I talk to you about an enterprise IT network, you might be thinking 5,000 nodes, 100,000 nodes, maybe 10 million nodes in the network, depending on where you work. In an ICS, there might be 10. Might be 100, could be 500. And that's about what you're gonna get in terms of an ICS network. That's awesome. That's a perfect environment to baseline, understand, and apply network security monitoring. Also, I want to talk about some of those difficult scenarios. So the last portion of my talk, I'll talk through a couple case studies. There is a huge lack of case studies in the ICS community. Nobody likes talking about what they're doing inside of various sense of infrastructure. So I'll try to talk about a couple instant response scenarios where NSM, in a very different way, was extremely applicable. All right, so we have little Bobby here. Uh, like I said, the comic I write with Jeff Haas. Uh, so little Bobby says, we need more scalable cloud-based threat intelligence analytics and automated big data endpoint security solutions. And Matt says, you have no idea what you just said, do you? And little Bobby says, not a clue, but I read off those words and I got invited to speak at a conference. So I figured <laughs> if I just said it two more times, I'd be a security expert. Matt says, yeah, that sounds about right. Um, so that's why I'm here. So, all right. ICS networks have few common hours. Here we have a substation that's underwater, uh, which is sort of common these days in Louisiana and other parts of the world. Uh, we've got a lot of flooding, a lot of engineers doing some good work there to try to keep the power on. So we have a little Bobby here. I love dad jokes. Little Bobby says to Chris this drunk, uh, what happened to this substation? And Chris says, a flood attack. And little Bobby's all upset. And then Chris says, they also got fished. Um, so <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I don't even have kids, and dad jokes are like the greatest things to me. Um, anyways, so. 
Purdue model, you will come to learn and recognize and understand if you're in ICS. And the reason I throw this up here, since most of us don't have common environments in an ICS, this is one thing that a lot of folks try to get to. This Purdue reference model says, basically, you have the IT systems up at those higher levels, the internet, the business networks, et cetera, and as you start moving down into like level three is where you would have supervisory systems or your SCADA network and many facilities, you'll have your you know, basic control and your process, and, and this model changes almost basically versus whatever industry does. Like, what I mean by that is, this applies to manufacturing, but the Purdue model on electric looks just a little bit different, and then people talk about 3.5 as the DMZ, no, that's 2.5, and it gets really confusing. So at a other point, and over to the right, you'll see what people try to get it into is just keep the control systems off the IT networks. That's what they generally try to get to. But what that looks like is a bunch of systems all over the place that are routable to everywhere. So Eric talked about, can I go onto a network and ping Google, or do a DNS resolution to Google? I've been in many sites that say, don't worry, we're air-gapped. Uh, and you're like, okay, well, google.com. Hey, it works. I can actually browse directly to Facebook. I don't think this is air-gapped. They're like, no, 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 that's really air-gapped. Um, and so you've got to verify that. Uh, so that's usually one of the first things I do when I go into facilities is check that. So if you're going to go into facilities, I would recommend check the air-gap first. Because it's usually one of the best places to just uh, be able to show them that you're coming to bring value when they think, well, I'm this security person, great. Uh, not going to do anything for me. And then you're like, wow, IPv6 is directly rattled to the internet to like your plutonium research area. Like that's an issue. Uh, they'll, they'll usually pick up on that. But the problem is in the actual community, even though we'll structure things in the zones, and you'll see this everywhere. Every like ICS facility drawing that has a Visio diagram, which is everybody, and they show all the cool layers of like terminal bus and control layer and all this other stuff. The reality of it is it's all super flat, right? It's just like one giant network on one switch, and maybe they have a firewall, and sometimes it's got inbound rules, sometimes it's got outbound rules, never both. Uh, and, and this is a problem. Now, there are some facilities that are doing amazing. So this whole like ICS sucks thing has got to die in the community. There are some ICS facilities that are blowing IT facilities out of the water. Uh, I was in a gas uh, control center where they had a Windows 10 environment with a uh, virtual environment with Bit9 whitelisting solutions at the supervisory level, where they had the Windows XP system that they had to have to run the, the uh, distributed control system they had was sitting on top of the Windows 10 in a VM so they could still maintain uh, that system, but in a more secure architecture. It was, it was amazing. It was one of the most secure facilities I ever walked into, and that's having you know, previously worked in the government as well. So while this is representative of most of the community, I do want to have that asterisk that there are some who are really leaning forward in the community and doing awesome work. Electric power industry, as an example, has done a lot of good work over the last decade. All right, so one of the things sort of before we get into deploying out and monitoring an ICS that I usually reference is the sliding scale of cybersecurity. So the whole idea behind the sliding scale of cybersecurity is when you walk in and you ask somebody, what do you do? And they say, I'm a cybersecurity person. That doesn't mean anything, right? Like that doesn't, that has helped me in no way understand what you do. You're pen tester, you're patching systems, what is that? Um, so I position that there's five categories of things you can do to increase the security in your organization and from a technical perspective. On the left-hand side is architecture. Building security in to start with. Are you patching a system? That's not cyber defense, that you're an architect at that point, and that's awesome. It's probably one of the most valuable things you can do is just the basics of security, but that's an architecture role. Uh, when you get down to passive defenses, that's your firewalls, your endpoint security solutions, anything that your vendors are telling you, no, no, this is an advanced, active, whatever solution, is it a box on the network? Great, it's a passive defense, and that's a good thing. If I can go home at the end of the night and it does something for me, I want that to take place. The active defense, if you will, is the humans getting involved. The humans actually monitoring on the network, responding to threats, learning from threats, those are your active defenders. That's what we're lacking mostly in the community. This is what Eric talked about as well, where he said, wow, we're seeing a lot of money get spent and everybody wants widgets and boxes and tools and AI and machine learning and all that cool stuff. A lot of it is cool. You gotta have the human in the loop or we're missing out, right? I can take a well-trained person, put them into a network with only open source tools, and they'll blow everybody out of the water with all their fancy tools that haven't been to any actual training. 
Uh, on the next side is intelligence. This is like the latest buzzword for folks, and I love seeing people that have like marketing, as, you know, CMO, they've been a business manager, et cetera, now all of a sudden they're at conferences speaking as an intelligence expert. I don't know where that comes from, um, but we're seeing a lot of intelligence experts these days. Uh, that's already well known, right? There's lots of doctrine and discussions written from military to private sector on what intelligence is, collecting and exploiting information. Um, and finally, offense. Well, why is offense on there? Because everybody seems to think that, like, responding to an attack, that it makes sense to go back and hack back, is absolutely the stupidest possible thing you can do. So I love, um, in ICS discussions, every now and then we'll see an infection in, like, a sensitive nuclear kind of uh, environment, and somebody always asks, well, I heard CSO online or heard whatever about this. Can I go hack back? Like, awesome. Why don't we shut off FTP first? Right? Like, like one step at a time. Like, for, for what's going to be relevant to your security. So, uh, in talking about network security monitoring for an ICS specifically, I really like starting on the left hand side of the scale, making sure my return on investment is met in each one of these categories as I step forward. If you do the proper investment in your environment, you should never be able to reach it to offense because we don't have infinite budgets. For national security discussions, great. For network security, focus on architecture, move it up, et cetera. So what I will note is in the ICS community, the architecture issue is by far the biggest challenge. We constantly go into environments that do not have managed infrastructure. And they say, hey, I want to do uh, security onion on the network. Security onion has actually become quite popular in the ICS community. They say, hey, I want to put security onion on the network and monitor the traffic. Awesome. Do you have managed infrastructure? Can I do like port mirroring or anything like that? And they're like, oh, God, no. <laughs> what, what, what do you want me to do? Uh, and, and we've noticed there's a lot of architecture challenges. So just keep that in mind. We're going to talk about network security monitoring stuff. But if you're in an ICS, I would prefer you to start on the architecture side and then start moving it along. Because that's where your return on investment is going to be. All right. So when we look at an ICS sort of deployment, a lot of folks usually think of potentially endpoint sensors and then like a site aggregator where you have like your security on your whatever else you're looking at. Midpoint sensors is what I'll call like all the other sensors that you have that you're daisy chaining them together, bringing back the information to like a nice ELSA or ELK cluster. And what I would note here is in some environments you can get away with not doing that. You can actually just put security on it and have the install there, maybe you only have a couple sensors. You can't get away from that in an ICS, and here's why. We have a lot of redundant architecture in an industrial control system. So as an example, if ABB or Honeywell, two big industrial vendors, go deploy a petrochemical facility, they, they say, this is a petrochemical facility, here's an ICS asset, a distributed control system we're building for this petrochemical facility. For that environment, they will copy and paste that ICS 200 times inside that company. So every time they have that ICS running, they've got 200 other versions of it running that are also making different process, they're doing you know, cracking of carbons, whatever else. The problem is all the IP addresses are exactly the same. So 10.10.10.150 is always the HMI and it's 200 different times that there's a human machine interface running on that IP address. You're like, okay, well I can at least grab the MAC to tell them apart, right? Well the problem is network routing and it's last routable hop that you give the MAC address. But also, endpoint solutions are very, very rare in ICS. You cannot deploy agents on a lot of anything, especially not physical controllers. So the problem that you run into is you might get a bunch of data back into ELSA or ELK, and you have a lot of IP addresses and no idea where on the network that IP address is. You can see an attack happening to dot .150, and there's 199 other versions of dot .150 that are not being attacked. So the important thing is having those midpoint sensors, especially using something like Security Onion, to add an, an additional unique identifier to say, look, this dot .150 is coming out of this sensor. So security ending sensor 1's dot .150, which will then allow you to actually go and take the appropriate actions in that range. All right, so hot oil furnace. Let's take a case study. So I've been talking for a little bit. Let's uh, take an example. If I told you to go into a refinery and I wanted you to gather data off the network, most people would first start and they'll say, okay, what are my tools going to be? What are my, well, okay, security onion, I've got this configured up this way. Definitely gonna want you know, TCP replay because maybe I don't actually uh, touch the network. Maybe I just ask for a packet capture and I replay it back against security onion and do all the alerting. Okay, cool, cool, cool. But then you get to the site and you realize that you have no PPE, uh, personal protection equipment. So before you even touch the network, you've got to have steel-toed boots, you've got to have hard hats, you've got to have all your training and certifications, you've got to have your uh, validation. 
I did instant response in an offshore oil rig, and the guy that was getting ready to go to the offshore oil rig from a different company was like, yeah, let's go. I'm like, cool, where's your helicopter license? They're like, what? I'm like, how are you gonna get there? You know, like, you're not gonna walk across the water. Um, you're not side of Jesus, this isn't gonna work for you. Uh, so there's, there's training and there's things that go into it before you even touch the network. So one of the big takeaways that I want you to have in our entire discussion today is in the ICS environment, once you get the data, all the skill sets that you've trained for are gonna be awesome in that environment. You're gonna have all the network stream monitors, you're gonna have all the skills and, and be able to do all the things that you did previously. There's no difference uh, except for maybe a prioritization of the systems. But in terms of finding evil, they do the same crap in ICS because your Iranian operators might not be the smartest people on that industrial control system environment. I'm gonna try the same stuff. The problem is, is getting to the data. It is the significant challenge that most people cannot get past is how do I get on site, how do I get past the culture challenges, how do I actually talk the engineering language and show them that I'm not gonna break their system and send them to jail, which most plant managers would go to jail if you did something incorrect, and be able to then start looking at the data. So all the NSM stuff is far down into it. Here though, if you'll take a look, so in that terminal bus and that control system layer, if we start talking zero, one, two, Purdue model, it's all on one network switch, right? And that network switch, especially in the older rigs, probably not managed. Now, they've got an MGAR firewall in this one. MGAR is a type of industrial control system uh, vendor that does firewalls as well. And they do port mirroring right off the firewall. So you can plug in there to do that, which is nice. The problem, of course, if you do that, you're not getting anything that's happening in the network. You're only getting things that are passing through the network switch back into the next layer. So that in and out aspect of that choke point monitoring is going to be vital in an ICS <laughs> because you might not actually be able to get into the segment that you actually want. But what's the beautiful thing here? They've got exactly three IP systems in this hot oil furnace. They have the Windows-based HMI, and also works as their engineering station in this case, and they have two control systems. In this environment, is a Rockwell and Siemens system. They've got serial Modbus running right here, and this is the other thing that I want to note. Most people who want to start doing ICS stuff jump to, awesome, let's do serial. My question is always, why? Like, oh, serial is the ICS stuff. I'm like, yeah, that's great. Your adversary still did a phishing email, came through the environment, did TCP IP stuff all the way down there. Why don't we catch them in the 90% route before you have to worry about understanding serial mod bus? At some point, do you want to be able to pull the engineer aside and understand what's going on in the process? Absolutely. But for the return on investment, <laughs> catch them coming into the environment at first. And you're going to have two access points into this environment. That network switch and the contractor coming on site with a transient device plugging directly into the environment. So those are the two places that you want to monitor first. Uh, in this environment as well, those two systems and then that one, so three systems, how easy is it to whitelist three systems and their communications? Pretty darn easy. Should that system be going to LinkedIn and updating its Facebook status and Twitter status and all that stuff? No, right? That PLC should only ever do that one function. And you might have things that occur that are outside the band of the whitelist. We never block anything in the ICS. We don't want to be that guy. Uh, but it is important to note that maybe the remote vendor remotes in at some point through the uh, VSAT location, comes in and does some maintenance. Cool, we want to see that, we want to observe that, we want to document it, we don't want to block. I see a lot of security startups these days that say, oh, I've got this IPS uh, that we're going to deploy and it's very specific to ICS. And so, like, how is it specific to ICS? We, we said ICS, didn't we? I'm like, all right, whatever. And like, it, this is specific. I'm like, so you're doing blocking in the ICS. They're like, yeah. I'm like, how do you handle false positives? We don't have false positives. I'm like, oh, great, you solve security. <laughs> um, so just note at some point, if you try to do any sort of blocking, you're going to stop a critical function in the safety environment. And this is probably the biggest difference in ICS. If you walk into a security company, say a large bank, you go into USAA, and you wipe the server that, you know, just they bring it down and has all the credit card information, they're gonna be super mad at you. They might have backups, they're gonna be super upset. You do that in a SCADA environment, you're gonna get somebody killed. That's the difference, all right? So that's the big difference in terms of the ICS. All right, second other example, electric power control centers. So an electric control power network, you have a lot of different network segments now. And a lot of words that we probably all don't understand. We're like, what's a DMS, a distribution management system? So there's a lot of that stuff you have to learn the language just to be able to speak it to get into those environments. The way you deploy security on you on that network is gonna be exactly the same. But if you don't know the difference between the DMS and the EMS, they're not gonna let you touch the network. That's what it comes down to in that case. But it's also important to note that in this environment, we might have different companies at play. So there might be one company that owns the control system environment, but down to the substations and the distribution levels, an entirely different company, maybe even state-owned infrastructure. 
um, on the transmission side that they're trying to communicate and send across uh, large portions of the power, it might be an additional company now under federal regulations. So in these environments, I find the most important thing on the NSM side is the choke points, the in and out of the environments. Those choke point monitoring, especially deploying security onion inside the DMZ, being able to remotely access it, not into the ICS, and doing the choke point monitoring is what returns a ton of value. And I will tell you, the ICS folks understand it. One of the things that I see come up more and more is that NSM is being brought into the ICS not by the IT security team, but by the operations technology folks who are used to understanding what's in their environment. So they know they need to have visibility into the lines. And so they have a beautiful light panel that tells them when, when certain circuits are energized or de-energized and they know where to respond. So the idea of having asset identification and having an understanding of data flows is second nature to them. So we see them actually the ones that are pushing NSM the most into these environments. All right, uh, let's keep going here. All right, so ICS, NSM, vital to the ICS. Let's walk through this real quick. Um, so we have the CISO here that asks Little Bobby and says, look, man, I need you to ensure that no attacks occur. And Little Bobby says, cool, what's the security budget? And CISO says, no, nah, we got to cut it all out. And so Little Bobby says, well, I assure you, we will never see any attacks. <laughs> and why I bring this up is in an ICS, a lot of this stuff stands out very, very trivially. Most attackers have no idea what that ICS is doing in the process level and what its baseline looks like. No clue. Um, and if you think, uh, kind of like what Eric said, if you think the APT has a magic eight ball to tell them what your ICS should be doing, think again, most of your APT uh, members are between the ages of 18 and 28. They're a government employee that's been their only job their entire life. Trust me, defense is doable, okay? Like, you can do this. So when we look at this, most of the problem with ICS anything is that people aren't looking. I get that all the time, like, well, why aren't we seeing more attacks? Well, they occur, and people just aren't piecing together the puzzle pieces to go, hey, that boiler failed, and no, it wasn't some broadcast storm on the network that caused it to be damaged. There was an attack in the facility, and now no one's talking about it. So we just got to start looking in these environments. All right, so to detail what an attack looks like, which is what we're trying to monitor for in the first place, you've probably at some point in your career seen the cyber kill chain. Now this is probably the most abused thing I've ever seen. The cyber kill chain was used for at least a, uh, five years worth of marketing from Lockheed. And I, I get it, but the problem I have with a lot of folks using the kill chain is they think of it like a defender model, which really was an intelligence model. How do we take data that are different types and stick them into little buckets and little categories so we can analyze out patterns and trade graph? That was the big value. Not stop your attacks earlier. But what I want to note here is all that stuff you're used to is IT land. Right? If you're actually going to do an attack in an ICS, that's the first stage. There's got to be a second stage to it. So myself and Mike Asante wrote a paper called the ICS Cyber Kill Chain, and we positioned that that first stage is what the attacker has to do to understand the ICS. In that second stage, they will have to, have to develop either a capability or knowledge specific to that environment to understand how to damage it how to bypass safety systems, how to uh, do physical damage if they're wanting to actually damage equipment. They're gonna have to test it out at some point. Usually, unless they just think very little of you, that's not gonna be on your network where they test it. It might be other facilities. I get questions all the time from a small electric power uh, co-op or a, a water utility saying, why do I care? It's like, well, actually, we've seen a lot of adversaries go after smaller facilities because setting up a $15 million ICS is expensive, but compromising yours and using it as a lab environment is free. So we see that a lot of times that people are training in smaller environments before going after larger facilities. Um, then there's gonna be some aspect of delivery, installation, or modification. I say modification because there's enough going on in the ICS to kill the ICS at any time, right? Like, a lot of people are like, well, you can't do a cyber attack on an ICS. I'm like, you kidding? Like, if you don't watch it closely, it'll kill itself. Like, of course you can. Uh, so some modification of the system itself could actually be really useful. And then the actual attack, loss of something, not just data leaving the network, which is exploitation and uh, exfiltration, but an actual attack. Now, what I wanna, I'm gonna flip back and forth real quick here, but what that basically says is we have an, an extended kill chain in an ICS environment. We have more steps the adversary has to go through to achieve their effects, which gives us as defenders, especially on the network security monitoring side, more steps and opportunities to detect that attack. More times that they're actually in, uh, going into the environment delivering something. 
So even in Stuxnet, so Eric mentioned that Stuxnet didn't call home. Well, it actually did, but for the version of Stuxnet that Eric's talking about, he's absolutely correct. But Stuxnet was in that environment for like six years, learning what was going on in the TANs in Iran. And the first version of Stuxnet was absolutely exfiltrating data out like crazy, trying to understand what that network looked like. The second delivery of the, another version of Stuxnet is actually what caused the physical damage. It didn't phone home, but we're already down in that second delivery phase, if you will. There's no reason for C2 at that point. All right, so what does this look like in reality? Um, first, I want to tell you electric power grid, just for those of you that haven't uh, spent your lives being super weird like me and like thinking like, wow, that's a cool thing, those transformers up there. Um, it's usually weird as well if you live near transformers. You always find like crazy people that are like, ah, transformers, make my head crazy. The government's out to get me. You know, it's like, you gotta, you gotta be careful. Um, but if we look at it, there's generally three large portions of a power grid that you want to be aware of. There's generation of electricity, there's transmission of it across long ranges, and there's distribution of it. For the last 30 years, we've prioritized generation and transmission because that's where you can do the most damage. Now, in 2015, there was an attack on Ukraine, which I was fortunate enough to be one of the, one of the investigators on, uh, and they targeted distribution. And that was actually sort of a punch in the face because we've been prioritizing security on the other two portions of the grid. To have somebody go after distribution was the soft underbelly of the community, if you will. So let's walk through this according to the ICS kill chain. And we'll talk about the monitoring impacts. So when the attackers, and I wrote the full report up there as well for anybody that's interesting. Uh, interested. This is the report we delivered to the uh, community. When it started, it was a spear phishing email, the beginning phases. The adversary did the reconnaissance, sent out a spear phishing email to these old Ergos or control centers. There was three of them. Got access to the environment by installing Black Energy 3 on the environment. The exploit itself was social engineering. Basically, the phishing emails was like, hey, if you want more features, click enable macros in the Word documents. And people were like, I totally want more features. Click. And uh, Black Energy 3 dropped. <laughs> so once Black Energy 3 dropped to the system, they started exfiltrating off the information, especially related to passwords and user accounts, and found that there were VPNs directly into the ICX, which is pretty common, actually. So they took the VPN access and moved into the ICS. That whole phase, the initial parts was as quick as you would expect in an IT hack. And then it slowed down. The moment they hit the ICS, it took them six months operating inside that environment to understand what was going on. So this isn't, if you probably heard uh, light speed cyber attacks or net speed cyber attacks or cyber attacks having cyber speed or whatever crap that means. Uh, no, they're humans. They'll get on the network quickly, but then they actually got to do something, right? So it's six months in that environment where from a monitoring aspect, the VPN usage was incredibly different. Session lengths are something you should be monitoring for. The session lengths of a uh, maintenance person coming into an ICS and doing remote maintenance might be three, four, five hours at a time as they're doing maintenance. For in this case, for the attackers, it was a couple minutes at a time looking for data and then jumping off the network. That should have stood out. The frequency aspect of it, the VPN connections. Um, normally, you might have somebody once every week, once every month. This was five times a day. Um, so it was a huge shift in what you could observe on the network data. Anyway, so in that environment, the attackers ended up finding that there were remotely connected uh, serial to Ethernet gateways. So at a substation, there is a lot of serial control system protocols, and it's communicating via serial. But that control center, physically separated, communicates via IP. So they have a little gateway in the middle that translates it, so serial to Ethernet gateway. They found those, and they developed specific malicious firmware for each one of those devices that said that when it came time for the attack, after they initiated the attack, which all it really was was learning the ICS and then using it against itself. They would just use the distribution management system to disconnect 97 substations across three regions of Ukraine. When they did that, they sent the remote firmware updates to all the devices and basically blew the bridges. So that if uh, defenders actually got access to their environment, they couldn't reach the substations anymore, so they had to drive out there to flip breakers and circuits to actually energize the grid. Problem being, it wouldn't have mattered anyways because their entire Windows environment was gone, around 600 systems gone, because they also used a piece of malware called Kill Disk, which deleted the master boot record on all these systems. And just to top it off, they also found a network-connected UPS, and the network-connected UPS, they decided to make sure that when the power went off across Ukraine, it also went across in um, uh, the power center. And lastly, they just did a telephone denial of service against everybody, because why not at that point? Um, so from a monitoring aspect, there's a lot of stuff here you could see on the network. All right, so let's start wrapping it up. 
so what makes control system software on iPads bad? And little Bobby asks. <laughs> Remotely viewing the process is not ideal, Matt says. However, you know, in worst case scenario, if you do that, at least don't allow remote control access to it. And little Bobby uh, starts freaking out. Matt says, what's wrong? He's like, oh, I just left my iPad in the cafe. Um, so we are starting to see more IT devices infiltrating into control centers. I actually don't think it's awesome. Um, but the business side of the house is pushing for it. So you've got to start including a lot of that into your overall string, overarching plan. So I want to note it's not all TCP IP. Um, you have to learn the engineering drawings as well. We have safety systems in these environments. Even when they weren't built for security, they were built not to kill people. So they were built for safety usually. Where if you, a lot of folks, and cute pen tester trick is usually like get in the environment, you see like an HMI, like I could totally click that and over, overflow the water tank. It's like, no you can't. I guess I can, it's right there. Like that's great, but we have blowout valves that, and altitude valves that if you did that, it would just release water in another portion of the system because it's designed to fail at strategic points that don't hurt people. So you actually have to understand sort of the larger system, if you will. So let's take a case study of where uh, difficulty in, in NSM. So we had this environment, an oil facility got infected with a worm, and they said, hey, you know, we need help. Uh, and through the network security monitoring aspect, we were looking at it, and what was going on is they'd go into the environment, they'd clean up the infection, they couldn't patch the systems because of vendor warranties, but they were able to clean it up. And then their actual ICS vendor would remote in and be like, guys, you're still infected. And so they finally called the incident response team, they're like, what's going on? And we looked from the network security monitoring side and looked and saw that all the lateral movement, all the stuff you'd expect with a worm, did clean up every time that they got into the environment. And every time the vendor remoted back in, it infected it again. <laughs> so it was actually the detection mechanism, if you will, was the fact that the infection correlated with the times of remote vendor access. And we were able to show and prove that through the network logs themselves. So even from just that NSM perspective, that's how they recovered that case. Um, from remote sites. A lot of times we'll have remote sites in a SCADA system. They're communicating through VSATs a lot of times, so very small aperture terminals. Satellite internet is not cheap, but you budget for it. You say, here's the amount of bandwidth I'm going to use this month. And if you ever go over it, it's not like your Verizon bill or like a little, you know, $10. It's a lot of money. You're talking thousands for going over your bandwidth cap. And so this site's way of detecting the malware wasn't the normal type of network security monitoring, but what I would consider the overarching ICS network security monitoring, that they saw their billing rate go through the roof. It was very cuckoo's egg in sort of a, a comparison, where they identified that their bandwidth overwent their billable hours, their, their charge for the company, and it cost them tens of thousands of dollars. They went into the environment and through the NSM aspect figured out that an adversary infected the system, called back out, was using the satellite uh, communications to jump out, and exfiltrating things off the network. The beautiful thing about that is executables and zip files should never be in an ICS. Should never find executables in an ICS traffic. So that's the greatest thing in the world, is to be like, hey, any executable file, any zip file, any compressed file, anything I can see clear text, carve it out, use Bro to dump it into a system, uh, have the digital hash queued up to you know, query BTI, please do not submit the binaries, the virus total, um, but at least check the hash. All that stuff's automatable, right? We don't have to do that every single time. We can develop an analytic for that. And so that's what they found. Another sort of case study, this is probably one of my favorite ones. There was a Nordic wind farm. Uh, you, you always see like anonymous utility, uh, unknown utility. It's like the intelligence community. We have leakers. It's always anonymous intelligence official. Like, I don't know who that guy is, but it was everywhere. Uh, so when we look at this Nordic wind farm, what we found in the actual detection mechanism was that at all these little terminals across the wind farm, they were getting patched by themselves. <laughs> that was really weird. Um, usually don't do a lot of patching, especially out of, out of band, out of cycle. Um, so they found out that a cybercrime group had compromised each of the stations, had figured out that they could do Bitcoin mining off of the extra process space, and they would then just keep the systems patched to make sure nobody else got on there. They were defending their territory. Um, the easiest sort of NSM way to detect that, besides the fact that patches themselves are getting deployed across your network, uh, was the fact that encryption was used for the adversaries to actually be pulling off their bitcoins and their information they got. The beautiful thing about an ICS is there's no encryption. Right? There should be not any encryption in your ICS. No one's doing it. Um, so that should stand out like a sore thumb. In this case, I wish I had a happy ending for you and, and sort of the story. Um, we told them what happened, and the response was, 
So you're saying they're doing it faster uh, than IT, and they're not using any extra process space? It's like, yeah, but you should probably still clean it up. And they're like, nope, leave it. Um, so, so, so that sucks. Um, it's not always going to end like you expect it. All right, Havex. Havex is one of your big APT-targeted pieces of malware um, in the Dragonfly campaign. How easy was it to spot Havex? Well, it did a bunch of ARP scanning across the network for all sorts of devices that didn't exist on the network to find them in first place. Shouldn't be a massive increase of ARPing in an ICS. Many ICS components don't even do ARP besides the first time. So that should have stood out. Also, just from an asset identification standpoint, they were using port 502 on four systems. Port 502 is Modbus TCP. A network segment that has Modbus TCP probably does not also have 102 for ISO TSAP. They probably do not have any sort of Siemens systems or Ethernet IP on 44818. It was very easy to whitelist out that environment. And anybody that was infected with Havex, it took like two seconds to look in a Wireshark sample and be like, yep, there it is, and that's what it is. So very, very trivial once you get the data sometimes. Um, so in a recap. Uh, ICS networks, they have those few commonalities. I want you to get familiar with the Purdue model when you go in these environments. A lot of the times it's just interesting to learn what type of industry you're in to speak the right language. But don't expect to have a solution that you deploy that's ready to go. That's one of the reasons most folks in the ICS like Security Onion. It's very tailorable. You deploy it and then sort of ready to go and then you tune it up to your environment and you're good. And, and that's really, really useful in an ICS. ICS NSM is vital to the ICS itself. When we look at those kill chain aspects of what attackers have to do, there's a long time that you can detect it in NSM usually. If an attacker wants to really do a physical or an actual damaging attack, it's going to take them a long time to figure that out. So being able to monitor for that is very important. Also, there's trivial methods. I'll talk about them more tomorrow at the uh, B-Size conference too, um, in sort of like some of the detection methods that we look for. ICS NSM, widely successful. We have seen more and more people in the community start using that. Not only those case studies, but far more about them as well. We are starting to see companies like PG&E, Simpra, large, you know, southern company, a lot of the larger players in the community really pushing the envelope on monitoring and learning their environments and making the right security investments. So what I would say to you is we haven't seen a lot of ICS attacks be public. Expect over the next five years to see a whole heck of a lot more. No, there's not a trend that attackers are just now caring about ICS. It's just the fact that we're just now looking, we're starting to see more. And then lastly down here for little Bobby, little Bobby says, you know, hey, Matt says, what are you doing, little Bobby? And little Bobby says, I'm preparing for battle. He's putting on pots and pans, a little wooden sword. He says, for what? And he says, protect the grid from its greatest foe. And Matt says, terrorists? Cyber attacks, ABTs, and Matt, you know, little body says, no, squirrels. Uh, and I'll note to you that when you go into an ICS, and this is the last parting thought I'll leave you with, don't be the guy or gal who comes in and says, security is the most important thing, and we're going to do security, and we're going to protect you against nation state. Most of them don't care. Most of them care about the day to day, what's keeping the safety and reliability of operations going. There are more squirrel attacks on transformers that have led to power outages than cyber attacks from Russia, Iran, and China combined. So you just got to actually balance out what they're dealing with and where the return on investment is. So the, the final parting thought, if you will, is that NSM and the ICS returns value to the safety and reliability of those operations. The security aspect is the byproduct of actually just doing it correctly inside your network. With that, I think I'm out of time, so I appreciate it, and I'll be around for questions as well. Thanks.